everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and today I'm joined by rapper, poet, songwriter and producer Dave Hook who is also known as Solar Eye and is part of Stanley Odd who have a new album out this week which we're going to be talking about, Stay Odd, The Magic of Everyday Things. But first of all, hello Dave. Hello, hello, how you doing? I'm really well, thanks for joining us. Good, to, yeah, pleasure to be here. Um, so as I say, we've got so much to talk to you about, but let's start with uh, Stay Odd and Stanley Odd, I suppose. If people only know the name, who are Stanley Odd? Um, I mean, Stanley Odd are um, a collection of oddballs and outcasts that came together around about a decade ago um, to make tunes, <laughs> pretty much. Um, we we formed as a band in two thousand and nine, uh, and we've been making thing stuff that could broadly be called hip hop ever since. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about the new album is there's quite a few different styles on there. There are some that you could say are almost going into a pop song, and then you've got more which are kind of rap, and then at the very end you've even got something quite epic, which we'll be talking yeah. about. Um, so, stay odds the new album. How did that come about? Um, I mean, it came about slowly, is probably the most honest <laughs> and immediate answer. Um, it came about over probably the last three or four years, to be honest. Um, it's quite a while since we've released, we haven't released a record, a full album since 2014. Right. We put our last single out before the, the sort of the album release schedule started. We put our last single out in 2016. Um, and we'd been busy collectively and individually ever since but it just taken us a long time to get a record made um, and then it really came I'd say the last two or three years it really started to come together mm -hmm. more like cohesively like a, we could see that it was going to be a thing <laughs> um, so at that point we started going into studios all around the country really booking different periods like either residential things for a few days or block bookings for a few days where we knew we could stay in overnight as well and just um, working on songs more in a more focused way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really when the record started to properly come together, I think. Um, it sounds like uh, a way of working from a different time, doesn't it? Being able to go around the country and drop into it, different it, studios. It, yeah, I mean, it does. You're right. It sounds like a it sounds like a luxury that was only afforded in the past, doesn't it? And it, I suppose that's the result of the fact that we did it over a, such a long period of time. Um, and and I think we didn't in the past. We'd always felt obliged to release something every year. From certainly from like 2010 to 2014, our release schedule was pretty hectic. Right. Sometimes an album and an EP a year, um, and and that produced that produced results interesting results musically i think but this was almost the antithesis of that we just we just kept making music till we were happy with it um I, again I, that's also the luxury of a band that's not on a label and it isn't being pushed in any direction you know that's the flip side of it i guess um we were just doing it for ourselves and how different is it to doing solar eye records then i guess you just, you know, you can just decide when you're working yourself. But are there other differences as well? Yeah, I mean, Solar Eye, the Solar Eye record in 2018 feels like part of the Stanley Odd universe to me. So, right. like, it, you know, it, it's another reason that it didn't feel to me like there'd been a big gap between Stanley Odd activity because that's produced by Dunt and Harvey Cartel. Dunt is also known as Samson, who's the drummer in Stanley Odd. So, so... Um, and, and the other guys from the band were in and out of sessions for that record. So it felt like we were still all kind of involved in the making of that, you know. Um, one thing that's different in a Solar Eye record, I think, is that you can do these longer form rap things probably more easily, you know, like, like expansive lengths of bars with minimal hooks and things like that. And um, that, that, that a more traditional rap format affords you um, and then writing with Stanley Odd you're th you're looking at different things you're looking at instrumentation for six people you're you're looking at like structures that tend to involve verses and choruses and middle sections and things like that so um, 
each of them allows you to express different bits of yourself, I guess. I like the idea of the Stanley Odd universe and then a bit like Marvel Universe, people are going off and doing their own films or albums and, and coming back together. Yeah, um, totally. You've also decided to release a, a book of lyrics, which is a fabulous uh, thing, actually. Um, why was that something you wanted to do? Uh, well, do you know, the book idea came about um, last year sometime. And everything changed with lockdown, didn't it? You know, like, the, we, we wouldn't have done a book if we hadn't had the, the year we've just had. Right. The book, the album was 90% finished when we went into lockdown 1.0, like a year past in March. And we used the first lockdown period to finish the record over, over distance, you know, like, I still had verses to write and record in here. Um, Samson produced, mixed and mastered the whole thing from his wee studio space in the south side. Um, we had to post a microphone and an audio interface to Veronica so that she could record her parts, which she hadn't done before. Um, uh, you know, so everyone, so it felt like a like an underground project we were working on, like with all these um, issues you had to overcome to to make it happen. Um, and so that was exciting. And then when we got to July, we started that this release schedule of a single every six weeks. And some point during that, like the latter half of last year, we were just talking about because the record was meant to come out last September. The, you know, we had a tour booked in Easter last year, which didn't happen. Obviously, festivals didn't happen. The the, the release, so it was a re. It was a reimagining of what we we're going to do with it, pivoting like everybody did and looking at where you're going to go. And and at that point, we're, when, we're, when everything's up in the air anyway and everything's up for grabs, we were, we've were we been fortunate enough to release everything since 2012 on vinyl and on CD. And I know people love to have a vinyl. Like I know vinyl, vinyl works really well as a format. But I, I started to wonder if, um, if it's just, you know, People love something tangible, something you can hold on to and something that tells a bit of a story of the of the album. And I wonder how many people keep the album as a collectible as the vinyl, but still listen to the digital download code. Mm -hmm. So that started the conversation of like, well, what if we took all the resources we have and poured them into telling more of the story with a, with a physical item yeah. than just a front sleeve, back sleeve, inner sleeve, you know? What, what if that expanded out into more pages? And, and that was kind of the idea behind the book. It, it works almost like the ultimate liner notes, isn't it? Yeah. You, you not only have all the lyrics, if you like, um, but you've also got little asides which tell you a little bit more about the songs and things like that. And it starts out with a manifesto, which uh, does exactly what you just said there. It says the main thing in the book is the music, but people don't buy music, but maybe people will buy a book still and maybe places will sell a book still. And... Um, I urge people to, you know, to get the book because, for one thing, it does read like a book of poetry, which shouldn't surprise me, but it, it kind of does, you know, like to see the words aside from the music and see how they really work. You know, you can see, without want to use a kind of, I have no unusual term, but the kind of craft in the, the lyrics, if you like, which is a lovely thing to be able to see. It's, I mean, it's great to hear that. I mean, it's, it's nice to hear that... It, that you feel it works, and it, and it's good. It's good to hear that you feel the the lyrics work on the page. You know, um, Ryan, who did all the typesetting and design, did a very very good job of it. And you know, went back and forth a few times about how that's laid out to make it read well. Because I think sometimes poetry that's written for the page looks great on a page, and sometimes words that are written to be out in the air don't necessarily look good on a page. You know, yeah. uh, so so I think he did a really good job of the layout to make that work. Um, and but but also, I mean, you're totally right. It is just like a it, it's like a an extended liner notes. It's, it yeah. it, it harks back to an, an era I was fortunate enough to be a part of, where you could buy a record and take it home and listen to it in your bedroom and like obsess over every bit of artwork as you listen to the record from start to finish. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and 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 it's sort of a wee rebellious act to try and attempt to recenter the record in that way for a, for a bit. <laughs> no, I mean, I think any book that you can sit down and just enjoy what you're reading with nothing else happening, you know, I would say is, is a definite success. Can we uh, talk about some of the songs in it? I mean, there's such a variety of, you talk about, you know, how you write a song in Stanley Odd, is it 
collaborative? Is it some people doing the music and then other people doing the words? How does it work? Um, I mean, it's definitely a collaborative process. Um, the, the, the lyric writing is pretty much my domain. Right. But musically, it's a collaboration with all of us. Um, the, way the, way, the way it tends to work really is um, we, we all make I, musical ideas, beats and instrumentals and stuff, and then they all get chucked in this like sprawling Dropbox folder of, of um, the well of ideas sort of thing. And then some of them get fished back out that well. So that's kind of how it works. It, it, um, when I've got time to write, I'll maybe pick a bunch of things that are exciting and spend a day or two, you know, just seeing where what ideas come out of them story-wise. Sometimes, you know, you hear the music and that takes you down a path with the story. Other times you've got fragments of ideas. For, for me as a writer, like having my phone sort of transform things, because I, well, when we weren't in lockdown, I tend to be on public transport a lot. So it gives you that opportunity to scribble down ideas all the time. Um, but the, th the thing that I think really worked with, with for us making this album was we then started to pick four songs or five songs every time we went into the studio for four days or five days. And, th and then we were like, these are the ones that we'll work on this time. And because everybody's lives have changed a lot in the last 10 years, we're not in a position we were in when we were younger and freer to just laze about and sprawl around and, and just make tunes whenever you feel like it. So those days became really focused. And, you know, you could spend all day and all night getting dead excited about being in the studio together. Uh, and and um, Tilo uh, and, uh, and Adam particularly borrowed a whole load of analog synths from people around the country, right. which, which it, I think was part, is part of the cohesion to the record sound. They've just, we had all these synths set up and, and a lot of the ideas that already existed got run through them and morphed and changed and then built back up. So it's, it is, it, at that point in the studio, it is a color, the studio for us is a compositional space, not a space for capturing stuff, I guess. And the songs themselves, the kind of subject matter, um, was it just what was kind of on your mind at the time? Because you kind of start off with, um, if you, we're still here, which is almost like we're back, you know, and here's what, and it's very funny, it's very self-deprecating, um, but uh, why did you decide that you're going to kick off the album with that kind of statement? I mean, if you were still here and stay on the title itself, are, are, I guess it's just about sort of resilience and, um, and Stanley Odd has always been, the core of Stanley Odd has always been about champion oddballs, the, the unusual and the uncomfortable and awkward in all of us. Yeah. You know, that I, like Stanley Odd was actually a, an, an alter ego, like an AKA that I used as alternative to Solar Eye at one point long ago. If Solar Eye was like the sort of um, superhero, impervious to damage, sort of larger than life lyricist, then Stanley Odd was the awkward wee odd guy in, in, in uncomfortable in social situations. Uh, and it felt like it was Veronica that said that's a good name for the whole band. And it, it felt like, because there's a bit of Stanley Odd in everybody sort of thing. So, so that and this, and then the stay odd idea of just like sort of championing that awkwardness and, and oddness that we all feel sometimes were sort of a lot of the core bits of what Stanley Odd's all about. So, so if you were still here, is is a is a version of that really sort of responding to to critics, but but also like you say, sort of not taking yourself too seriously in the process. It's also quite cathartic. There's some. It's a really hip hop like. Uh, or a common hip hop trope, I guess, you know, to take some, a negative attribute or, or a connotation, own it, repurpose it, and then send it back. And, and I guess that's what that song does. <laughs> it even goes to the cover of the book because the first quote on the back is definitely untrendy songs a review. Yeah. Which makes me smile when you see it. Yeah, and, and that that's a genuine review. I just I just anonymized the reviewer, but uh, it, it again, and and that that back cover felt like a kind of exactly what we wanted to do. The first review is by a, a not particularly um, uh, good sort of critique of a review. The second is from. Elmo, who's a pal, <laughs> and, and and who mess who who uh, 
Facebook messaged me that message at about four in the morning, burst in his own house. And and then the third one's from Ian Rankin. So just, if you you know if you want a real one, there's a there's a real one too, sort of thing. A real living person that uh, we yeah. don't know is there too. <laughs> There's there's also kind of um, the feel of um, kind of looking back in uh, quite a lot of the songs um, and looking back together. Was that something that you wanted to kind of get across? I'm thinking of songs that recycling in particular, where you're looking back to younger days. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I mean, I, the, you're right that there's a lot of variety in terms of the topics across yeah. the songs. Um, I think I think probably the cohesion in terms of the content is is the contradictory, if you like, you know, like the fact that we're all complex, contradictory human things and, and that's okay. <laughs> and and that it's it's better than being like, we the way really that we make sense of the world, as everyone knows, human beings make sense of the world by putting things in boxes. We can't understand the world without classifying it, right? But as soon as we do that classification process, then we also limit the boxes that we've put around other people and ourselves. So. So it was kind of like a, a bit of pushback against that in itself, that it's okay to have a political view on one song and then a bunch of daft things that rhyme just for the joy of the words on the next song and then yeah. reminisce a bit about childhood. <laughs> yeah, one of my favourite tracks is Love Letters, which is exactly that, about loving letters, about loving language. It's just great. And it's just someone going, you know what, this is, what I, this is why I do this. It's why I love to do it. It, yeah, it was great fun to do that tune as well. Like it's like you say, it's it's kind of just for just for the fun of it. <laughs> and on the uh, Bill Oddy, you even mentioned the Young Ornithologist Club, and it, I was a young ornithologist. It really, I'd forgotten I was a young ornithologist till. Oh yeah, that's right. I had. You know, it's, so I mean, that's a, that's an end joke in the band as well, because so was I, and so was Samson. Uh, and and, we, and it's it's the sort of thing like yeah, the, the sort of distant memory of like some auntie or somebody's like signed you up to to like a the the uh, young ornithologist magazine or something you right. know um and and then we just thought like the yoc could be like a like just the idea of like the young ornithologists being a, a wee team that runs about <laughs> exactly in fact i've got a memory of going to see bill Oddy speak in east Kilbride, and it was kind of because we'd like the the a uh, i've got the goodies show and that's why we'd signed up. It was like, we like the comedy, but we have to sign up to this to get in to see them. I mean, it just took me back. Right. Uh, and uh, there's the, obviously, there's a lot of, like, of politics in there as well. And they lie and, and other things like that. But the balance is, it's interesting what you're saying. It's not just like we've got one theme and we're going to go through this. And it kind of makes sense if you're saying this is an album that was done over a period of time and can, with a, all sorts of different concerns as well. It makes it, because um, often, I think particularly sometimes with hip hop, they're um, immediate records, they're made quite quickly and you know, that's the way it is, but this has been different. That I mean, that that's totally true. Yeah, very often hip hop records capture a place in time, don't they? You know, like um, some of the most famous hip hop records have been made in a couple of weeks and uh, and they capture the exact vibe and the feeling of that moment. And uh, yeah, this is definitely a, a more of a sprawling, uh, time period. <laughs> well, it goes to the kind of subtitle, which is the magic of everyday things, which I think feed, does feed into the book. But I also think it feeds into a lot of Scottish hip hop, where people are rapping about or making records about their everyday lives. That seems to be a real kind of trope through it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I mean, that's one of the things about hip hop culture globally, I think, that sometimes folks that, that aren't particularly aware of what hip-hop really is, have a problem with how can hip-hop be Scottish and be authentic, you know, and it, it goes to the fact that hip-hop is always about, a certain, to a certain degree, chronicling your environment, you know, and, and tell, voicing the experiences of, your, of yourself and the people round about you. And if, if we understand that that's a core element of hip-hop, then it can, it can grow roots anywhere. <laughs> It's interesting because it seems to be something that's ha it chimes with what's happening with, in Scottish literature at the moment. You've got uh, read, uh, writers putting books out, which is about their young lives and where they're from and where they've grown up, which is still quite rare. And uh, and also, um, I was I did a podcast with Iona Fife, and we were talking oh, about yeah. the use of Scots language in music. 
and she said uh, um, it's accepted in trad in traditional music. It's almost you know, expected in a way, but it doesn't really happen in pop. And it was only after I stopped talking to her, I went, but it does happen in hip hop. It does happen that people are rapping in their own voices. And that's, is that something that's developed or has that been happening since you've been involved in it? Well, I mean, it, it has been happening for a long time. First of all, I think Iona's great. And I think what she did was great for like the, the, the sort of success she had taking Spotify on recently was yeah. amazing. Absolutely. Um, I'm a fan of her music. I think she, I think she's brilliant. Um, but she's she's right in that um, it's ex, it's it, like your own voice is expected in certain music styles and not others. I guess yeah. Um, yeah. I've thought loads of it, this because of the genre that I work in. I guess um, first of all, if we think about Scottish music and pop music, we didn't really hear a Scottish voice in pop until the Proclaimers, probably. Yeah, we mentioned and even, that, even, even then, at the time, it was considered a novelty rather than a radical rebellious act, which it probably is more accurate, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you can trace like a, you can trace a trajectory from there to like the 90s and sort of Glasgow indie bands and, uh, you know, Arab Strap, uh, Bell and Sebastian and, and bands uh, from that sort of era yeah. introducing their own voices into song yeah. uh, then we can leap forward another decade and you've got like uh frightened rabbit and twin atlantic starting to appear which are so we've now got like bands that are are known globally yeah. singing in scottish accents so i think it is a long slow process of normalization for scottish people of hearing and seeing ourselves reflected back in culture and being okay with that. <laughs> That's right. It's that kind of getting rid of the, the cultural cringe that was happening for so long. For instance, if my I can't remember exactly, but if my parents had seen the uh, proclaimers, it would be like, oh, no, that's not the right way to sing a song. Type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's linked into so many things. There's a post-colonial element to it where, like, Scotland as both colonizer and colonized at the same time do you know what i mean and that and that's that's extremely complicated in our culture isn't it like because we we have been both those things for the last 300 plus years um and and we've also been at the same time being grown up to speak told to speak right and told that the way we speak is incorrect rather than different you know so all those things are tied up in there but then in 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 rap like you say it rap the performer in rap is so intrinsically tied to the to the individual that's doing it <laughs> that yeah. th there's there's no the membranes really thin there there's no difference between the artist and the storyteller I, I guess and 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 you're chronicling so often it's in first person narrative and you're so often chronicling your own experiences that you can't tell those stories in a false voice <laughs> yeah. you, you know and I, I guess you take melody out of it as well so it's there's Melody gives a possibility for being more flexible with accent, probably, but speaking voice doesn't. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think the last time I saw you would have been at a Scots language conference at the Piping Centre, where you were part of a panel, um, and it was about spoken Scots. Was that right? That that's right. Yeah. Um, and that was a that was a really good uh, event. I was I was quite nervous about that because I, I certainly I felt out of my comfort zone, um, and also. I, I I didn't I, I think I've probably thought more since about the difference between accent and dialect and language and all those sorts of things, um, and it was it was great to to be part of that panel and part of that conversation. I, I've I've got a quote that has always stuck with me from a a scholar a Yiddish scholar I think, um, who is he's known for say for 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 repeating the quote. Apparently it was somebody in his audience that said it. Mm -hmm. that the difference between a language and a dialect is an army and a navy, <laughs> which I thought was a really good way of like saying basically the only difference between dialect and language is the number of people or the cultural value you ascribe to it or something oh, like that, you know? That's all um, I, so going back to that thing about language, it, can your appearance on that panel kind of makes you think about how far hip hop has gone in this country that it's been, that you've been invited to be on this. And, Let's talk a little bit about your PhD, if you don't mind. 
because yeah. now I'm going to, as all PhD t- titles are, they're usually very long, but uh, an auto ethnography of Scottish hip hop identity, locality, outside of them, and social commentary, <laughs> which is kind of what we've been talking about. So, why did you decide that this was something that you wanted to do as an academic thesis? Well, it's funny. I mean, do you know, interestingly, I, my, my, my Viva was a good experience when I, when I did my, when I defended my thesis. Mm-hmm. I think if the people that you're, that are your external examiners are, are really good at what they do, then it is a good challenging conversation rather than a sort of nightmare experience that you hear about sometimes. And, but one of the, one of the things that, one of the first things that the, one of the external examiners said to me as I, as we started was he read that title out and he said, it's not a very Stanley odd title, is it? And, and it was a really good point. Cause I think, um, see, I, I, certainly at that point still what I was trying, what I was trying to do was to prove I can converse in an academic forum and and maybe now the the, the thesis might have been called stay on the magic of everything or something you know somewhere where you were a bit braver with the title um but yeah the reason i wanted to do it was well first of all i didn't know you could do a phd by published works in your in your own songs in your back catalog but um I, i've worked at edinburgh napier uni for a, a number of years and the, the uni made me aware of it and said you know this is something that you can do which was great. I, I've I've been given lots of opportunities to progress there. Um, having started out as a technician building studios, then given the opportunity to train to teach, then given the opportunity to do the degree and so on. So, the, yeah, the opportunities have been great there. Um, and and really for me, once I realised I could do it, it was it was a license to geek. Basically, it was a license to to delve even further into the stuff I was obsessed with anyway language and culture and hip hop culture and Scottish culture and how do they intersect and, and, and where does my work fit in amongst all that sort of stuff. And uh, has it been published or did you just have to check it out online? It's, it's, it's published online, so it's available to read as a PDF. I mean, there are physical copies in the library at Napier, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's available as a PDF. What What's strange is if you do, PhD by published works is something that's normally done more in a traditional route. Academics from a traditional academic background would maybe have published five or six papers over the last few years. And then the published works is basically a write a wraparound that, that they write to show where all the research is. Yeah. And um, so it means they've published all these papers in journal articles already. Um, in, in my case, my thesis was considered to be the last five years of musical output. So it was my back, my musical back catalogue. So I ended up writing a much bigger critical appraisal to, to engage with it. But what it does mean is I'm now looking at ways to publish elements of the, the yeah. thesis. So I, I published a, a couple of articles last year, one in Global Hip Hop Studies Journal and one just uh, published last week in Popular Music Journal. And that's basically pulling out chapters of those and then presenting them in other ways to 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 sort of uh, expand where they go really <laughs> that's fantastic and uh, did it make you look upon your own well it must have if you're looking at your own work but scottish hip-hop wider in a different way De- definitely um i mean because because i think one of the worries that you have i've spoken to other artists that i've encouraged to maybe think about doing this um and and some people's concerns I, I, and it definitely occurred to me are what if I look too closely at what I do, will I break it? <laughs> you know, like like, like if I understand that how the cogs and gears turn, will the magic stop working? Sort of thing. Um, and I think maybe there might be an element of that along the way. <laughs> but you come out the other side of it, I think, just with a better understanding. Like um, I, I a lot of some, for example, some things you think you're doing that are like unique and really clever, you go, oh, hold on a minute, loads of people have done this already, <laughs> and you understand that. But also it just gave me a broader understanding of like, of, of what I think hip hop is, and like, also how I feel about lyric writing and storytelling. It's really interesting you say that about not wanting to kind of break the magic or whatever. I find that that's musicians talking are more like writers don't mind talking about what they do. Painters don't really mind talking about what they do, but r- definitely musicians are a bit like, oh, I didn't really think about that, or I don't want to think <laughs> too much about that. You know, it's it's interesting. It is funny, and I, but I think um, 
I, I certainly am, I've enjoyed the process. Like songs like, to be honest, songs like um, uh, Love Letters that we were just talking about, I wouldn't have written beforehand. But, so it's it's kind of like enjoying the mechanics of it and then, and then sort of reveling in unpicking it. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have come about if I hadn't already spent the time analyzing stuff. And you talk about, you know, the Stanley Odd universe, but it also seems to me that Scottish hip hop has its own universe where it's very, it seems to have really grown in the last 10 years. It seems to be really supportive of each other and a lot of collaborations going on between people. And yet there's a lot of people don't really know that it's happening, maybe apart from yourselves and, and Loki, maybe and a few other better known names. Do you think that's right? Do you think that's changing? I think it's changing. A, a glacial pace. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you're right. The, the, the interesting thing about the Scottish hip hop community is people have been making hip hop in Scotland since the 1980s. Yeah. You know, um, and some of the folks, some of the pioneers that started that in the late 80s, early 90s are still making brilliant music. Um, but it's remained this underground subculture for so long. Yeah. And it, it definitely... It seems to go in, in in cyclical waves now of, of the media going, oh, Scotland has a hip hop culture, let's talk about it. Oh, we're not interested. Oh, Scotland, you know, round in, round in cycles. <laughs> That's really interesting. That is really interesting. Um, so who who would you, this is probably a hard question to ask you, but say who would be a few names that you would recommend? Because I think when you use the word community, that's what comes across to me is, it is a community. I mean, um, perhaps more so than, and other, there seems to be more crossover between other genres in Scottish music than maybe there is with hip hop. Do you think that's fair? Maybe so. Um, I, I think I think it's exciting to see where the crossovers start occurring. Um, but yeah, it does seem to live out on its own wee island for a lot of the time. Some some of the there's so many. One of the things that's exciting about hip hop in Scotland is the fact that it has never become commercially successful. Because as a result, it's never developed a sound that defines it and therefore everyone makes it. <laughs> and I think, although the flip side of that is it would be really nice if it did make a little bit more uh, commercial impact just because it would give people the financial stability to make more music and yeah. to do so in, with their own time, you know. And I think that's really important. And also, I mean, people are recognising that across Scotland, I think. But, but that diversity of sound and interpretation of what it means is is really interesting to me you get such a like such a really wide range of folks making rap and hip hop um there's also a intergenerational thing going on with different age ranges and eras and things like that you know it was a, it was really exciting to see nova win the say award yeah, yeah. um i think she's a really exciting artist and um and yeah, it was anything. I also am an advocate of anything that brings attention to to one person w within that community is only a benefit to everybody else as well. It only opens the door to shine a bit of light on everyone else too. Absolutely. Um, we were know. talking uh, to someone about Shuggy Bain winning the Booker Prize and how that suddenly shines a light on all these fantastic Scottish writers because people, the international eye, if you like, or the other eye is is going, oh, what else is happening there? And it can only be a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely, and um, it's interesting just now as well. Um, just just to see like how different styles of hip hop, rap, and grime are influencing folks. You know, like Shogun is a phenomenal lyricist and somebody that's working so hard on his craft. Visibly, you can see his output is is so regular as well. Collaborations, it's definitely overground. So that that's really exciting stuff. Um, the stuff that Steg's, the music Steg's been making in, over the last few years is like just gets better and better and better, I think. And and the conceptual th ideas as well. Uh, so it's been great to collaborate with him and all that stuff. Steg's uh, like, album is just an astonishing uh, album if anyone hasn't heard it yet. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Well, Dave, thanks so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. It's so good to have you on. Uh, not at all. Ple pleasure to be on. Uh, thanks for having a blather. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. <laughs>